Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Audrain Automobile Museum in Newport, Rhode Island. I'm Donald Osborne. I'm very happy to bring you the latest in our series of virtual webinars here for the 2020 Audrain Newport Concours and Motor Week. Of course, we're not holding the traditional Concours and Motor Week uh, this year due to the uh, pandemic, but we are bringing you one of the features that has proven so incredibly popular at last year's event, which is our seminar series. And we started a series with one entitled The Next Next Generation, in which uh, I chatted with four enthusiasts, uh, one 17, two 13-year-old and a 10-year-old, who reassured us that the future of cars and interesting cars is alive and well, despite what you might read in some quarters. Um, the next one that we had was From the Racetrack to the Opera, in honor of the exhibition that we have here in the museum that you see behind me, uh, marks that did it all, featuring manufacturers who built compelling and winning race cars, as well as successful and wonderful, luxurious touring and road cars. And for that seminar, we were joined by Anne Brockington Lee, uh, an amazingly passionate collector and woman of great style and, and knowledge, Steve Babinski, a Pebble Beach winning restorer and also collector and enthusiastic driver of vintage cars, and Louis de Fabre Beckers, who's the head of design for Touring Superleggera. And they shared their ideas on what characteristics make it possible for a brand to succeed on both the racetrack and the boulevard. And tonight, uh, we're talking on a topic that I think is absolutely fascinating. We've had a couple of technical difficulties and two of our panelists are not with us at the moment. We're hoping that they'll be able to uh, come in shortly. Um, and the topic is real or fake or does it matter? And um, tonight, hopefully we will be joined by Miles Collier and Murray Smith, but I'm here right now with my friend, Bill Warner, the founder of the uh, Amelia Island Concord d'Elegance, a noted racer, uh, he, he was historic racing when it was regular racing, and it just became historic <laughs> around him. Uh, <laughs> also, I noted, I think my first one was 1979. <laughs> and he's still driving a 1970s car in racing, which is absolutely astonishing. Um, and uh, Bill is also, in addition to being the, the founder of this amazing show, the Million and Concord d'Elegance, He's also a very accomplished and successful and lauded photographer and writer who worked for many, many years for Road and Track magazine. So many of those great photographs that you saw at, at so many of the great racing events when racing was really quite magical were taken by William Warner. And uh, he still is pretty handy with a camera today, even though people often ask him when he's walking around with his camera, how do you make a phone call on that? But uh, nonetheless, <laughs> he, he persists uh, in his activities. Um, and he also, as I mentioned before, is a very keen racer. And one of the things that really gives me a great thrill is to go to YouTube and watch some of the videos that Bill has posted of his in-car camera shots because they are driving lessons in themselves. It's just absolute pleasure. And I'm not just saying this because he's here uh, on camera with me. It's because of the absolute truth. Uh, now, during this uh, presentation, we're also going to be able to take selected questions from you as, we watch the, as you watch the presentation. And in order to ask a question, please submit it in the Q&A portion of your screen. And that way we'll take a look at them and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Um, so again, I apologize for the technical difficulties that have kept uh, Miles and Murray away from us for the moment. Hopefully they will join us, but I can guarantee you that any conversation that I have with Bill Warner is always an entertaining one. And um, I'm gonna start off with a really a provocative question. Ah, here's Miles coming back in. And I'll do another introduction of Miles as soon as he's back in with us. By the way, you know, you were responsible for us doing the trophies at Amelia years ago. Remember we were at the Mila Mila and you showed me that one trophy and you said, wouldn't it be exactly. great to get a car together? So we got 13 of them. Excellent. Okay. Oh, we have, we have hey, Miles hello. live. Hello, Miles. Well, hello, hello. I apologize for that. We are um, uh, jerry rigging this thing as best we can. And uh, I think I'm with you now in, in yes, one you are. way or another. You are indeed. And, and you know, it's one of the things that, uh, to me, obviously, this is a, a very trying and strange time for the entire world. 
but I think that this is another, another example of the fact that we have all become so much more resilient. You know, if things don't work out exactly the way we expected them to, we adapt. So that's a great thing. And, and um, I was saying, I was introducing uh, Bill, and now I'll do a full introduction of Miles Collier. And Miles Collier um, <laughs> is one of my favorite people. Um, if he were born a Renaissance prince, he couldn't have done more than he's done in his life. Uh, a businessman, philanthropist, fine artist, a painter, wonderful painter, um, driver, uh, collector par excellence, and uh, someone who single-handedly has really done so much to bring the connoisseurship of collecting into the public forefront. Um, it's not simply just buying pretty objects. It's why do we buy the pretty objects and what do we do with them once we have them? What is our responsibility in owning historic objects? And that's something that's very near and dear to Miles's heart. Um, he is the founder of the Revs Institute in Naples, Florida, the founder of the Revs program at Stanford University, and the, um, the guiding force behind the Miles Collier collection, which has as its base the great Briggs Cunningham collection, which was a, an amazing place to start. But I think that it's certainly um, true to say that, Miles, you have added to the great luster of that wonderful collection with your stewardship over the years. Oh, well, you're very kind, Donald. It's uh, always, uh, everyone always appreciates being flattered. It um, you know, suits the soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the last piece of flattery you'll get uh, this yeah. evening. Yeah, you got ugly. Um, so uh, I introduced our topic, fake or real, and does it matter? And of course, for these two gentlemen, and as I said, I hope that Mary Smith will be able to join us in progress. Um, people who spend their time surrounded by and, and knowing more about racing and sports racing cars than most of us in the world will forget. It's especially a particularly vexing question when it comes to competition cars. And I'll throw this out, the first big question, Bill, is it ever acceptable to make a copy of a historic car? Is it acceptable? Um, yes. The original car does not exist any longer, and you're able to do it accurately. And I would use the, uh, the Auto Union Grand Prix cars that Crossway and Gardner built. Yep. And the only way you'll ever see one of those is if someone builds one. Unfortunately, people don't have the resources of the Audi Corporation to clone an auto union car. So there, there are caveats in my answer, but the caveat is, yes, providing the original doesn't exist. Miles, your opinion? Well, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a pragmatic view, <clears throat> which is that horse left the barn a long time ago. <laughs> there are a lot <laughs> of, supposedly uh you know real racing cars that are are replicas uh and look uh, i don't know that it's a bad thing um here's here's the thought i mean if you have uh, a incredibly original and valuable automobile and we still you still want to experience it and we still want to watch it operate at the maximum of its performance levels might it not make more sense to um, build a accurate replica, which you can race as hard as you want without worrying about what you have done to a priceless piece of our automotive heritage if you stick it into the tire wall. And uh, as a result, um, I, I say that uh, it probably is okay to uh, replicate cars provided triple underline provided that the automobile is an accurate recreation of the original and more importantly that its performance parameters are exactly the same as the original so you know no funny heads no funny shocks you know and all that kind of a thing so uh yeah it's okay to uh to uh, to replicate racing cars one of the it's, problems I've seen, you know, like 700 horsepower Lister Corvettes with, you know, with uh, uh, Richard Childress motors in them, is that the sanctioning bodies uh, don't enforce that, you know, and uh, Lola T70s with 700 horsepower. I mean, let's, let's get serious here. 
these cars were dangerous when they were new. Add another 300 horsepower, and you know, look at what happened to the Shadow at uh, at uh, Road America. You know, they're they're pumping out well, 200 horsepower more than that car ever had. And that's, it is, it that's is the issue, okay? But but that doesn't relate necessarily to uh, replicas per se. You know, that's the issue of. Uh, you know, you've got, I'm just looking at the D-type Jaguar behind you, Donald. You say you've got that D-type Jaguar and we take it to some of those wizards in England and we get it so it can turn 7,000 RPM and it's making uh, 415 horsepower. Well, it's kind of immaterial whether it's an original chassis or it's a replica car. What you've done is you have, have perverted the original uh, performance of the thing and turned it into something else. Now that I have a problem with. So and that, and that is something question, which is highly fiddled with racing cars that have way beyond their normal per performance uh, are something else. And I, I, and I am offended by that. You, you yeah. guys are the absolute best because I write down a bunch of questions on a page and I say, well, you know, we're going to have a conversation. And of course, in the first two minutes of the conversation, <laughs> I can just rip all this stuff because you've covered everything that I was going to ask you because that's how you guys are. Um, but it does bring me to this, um, which is a great question. What is the public looking for and what should they be given? Do they want historical accuracy or do they want a show? And how do you do that? May I? Bill, yes, you may. <laughs> first of all, the show was when the car was built. Who wins the race? doesn't make a hoot for me. I like to go see the car, hear the car, smell the car. Um, nothing like castor oil and orange blossoms at Sebring. I mean, it's, it, I take that back to when I was 16 years old. But there are people out there who want to see a race. And I think that's the problem. Uh, I've been on my soapbox for years saying there should be historic class and a vintage class, and ne ne neither of the two should meet. I think there's a time now where true historic cars of historic should be allowed to be exercised and driven uh, briskly, but not necessarily race. And Miles? Well, um, uh, 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 check, technical problems. I'm with I thought you were there. Well, we'll, we'll go back while Miles uh, rejoins us. I think we'll go back to you, Bill. Uh, oh, you know? It, oh. is, it, is, it is one of those things. Hey. Uh, there he is. He's back. OK. Um, back and clearer than ever. Oh, we don't have your audio, though. You're muted. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. And a muted Miles Collier. You're muted. Go to audio and unmute. You're still muted. We liked you before. <laughs> nope, still muted. This is the problem with actually updating technology because we're all terribly analog and uh, we're in the digital age here. You know, um, another thing since we're waiting for Miles to come up on that thing, um, in racing and race cars, many, many, many of them morphed over their career. They had multiple careers, multiple liveries. They were upgraded. You know, uh, Ferrari GTO, for example, 250 GTOs were a couple of them that turned into four liter cars over their period. So, you know, you, you, with the AACA, if you're showing a race car, you've got to pick what period it was and substantiate it with the photograph. So, uh, uh, to say it's correct, letter correct, you have to pick the period in which you're restoring the car as to make it correct. Does that which make sense? Which also goes back. I'll let I'll let, I'll let you um, respond, Miles, because we couldn't get your response earlier. Okay, uh, so I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm one iteration behind at this point. We were uh, uh, start me up. Give me give me one word to go with. Oh, sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, racing. Show or oh, historical yeah, okay. significance? Well, um, look, I mean, I, 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 I think what people want to see with racing cars is racing cars being operated at what appears to be racing speeds. 
uh, you know, we need to sort of do some mental uh, um, experiments here, maybe. Uh, on the one hand, we have racing red and tooth and claw, which you can see at Goodwood. And boy, let me tell you, if F1 could put on a show like that, they wouldn't have any financial problems. Uh, that's clearly a show. And uh, people go there for the show. And guess what? When I tune into Goodwood, I go there to watch the racing because it is absolutely stellar. Uh, and, you know, and in, in many ways, those cars were designed, as, as Bill said earlier, he said, you know, they, they, they put on their show back in the day and who wins now doesn't matter. I agree with that completely. On the other hand, the things were designed to put on a show. Uh, if you are going to race, you are going to run the risk of hurting stuff. And that's the big problem with putting on a show today. But it, I, I think that's also the magic of the thing. And that's why I say, you know, we get back to it's okay to run a replica. And it's, that's not in you know, contemplation of the issue. That's actually descriptive of the issue as it exists today. There are, look, I, I was, and then I'll shut up. But uh, some years ago, there was the Alan Mann Trophy at the uh, owners, at, at the members meeting at Goodwood, uh, what, three years ago. It was an all Ford GT40 race. And it was a barn burner. I don't know if you, any of you out there saw that thing, but it was a barn burner. Up to including, I think somebody caught a uh, wheel bearing on fire. So it was almost a GT40 burner. Uh, and I remember right at the end, as the cars took the checker after the hour or whatever it was of racing, that the, one of the announcers said, and here's our fourth place car, the first original GT40. The first three cars were replicas. Yes. Who cared? It, lo it looked like a race. It was a race. The cars looked like GT40s. They operated within the parameters of the GT40s performance. It was stunning. And the issue so is that, that, that even the the real cars that were part of that event had already been transformed because of modern life safety tech requirements, as well as, you know, they had funny shocks, you know, they had, you know, they probably had roller rockers in them. They had all kinds of stuff going on. What a great show. If you want to get people excited about old cars, take them to that. So I rest my case. We don't want to see <laughs> sedate parades of important cars, you know, motoring around in third gear at 4,000 RPM. It, I mean, the, the automotive historian amongst us appreciates seeing that. But what I want to see is you know, give it a little stick. Give it a little welly. Thank so you. then the responsibility of the organizers then is to create a framework so that you can have cars that have, as you said, the performance envelope of the originals, but can be replicas. So you don't get sort of super hot rods mixing it up with original cars on the track. Unfortunately, that's what, what happens at Goodwood yeah. and, and Le Mans, uh, retro Le Mans. How many Lola T70s were built here in Jacksonville, Florida by Matt, Mac McClendon and shipped to Martin <laughs> Bahrain and had the exactly. on them? I mean, and, and that's the problem because 20 years from now, who's going to know where that car came from? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, look, look, I'm not saying there aren't issues here. They're, 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 we've got more to spend some time on uh, and talk about. But look, the biggest problem in, in historic racing today with valuable cars is that there are people out there on the grid with two different agendas. And that's where the problem arises. You can't have a grid with people with different agendas. You've got some drivers out there who want to give their car a little bit of a, of a show. They want to drive it well. They want to demonstrate it to the public. They know it's valuable. They know it's priceless. They don't want to hurt it. They're going to be responsible and they're going to be good people. Also on that grid are a bunch of people uh, who have been uh, told by the owner or they are the owner. And it's like, you better go win this thing. This is a piece of sporting equipment and uh, we want to see you at the sharp end. They're going to go for it. And if they happen to be driving a, a replica or a car that they're treating like a replica to wit one of Bill's uh, 700 horsepower Chevy uh, Listers, for example, uh, it's not going to be a happy moment when, to, when a, two different agendas in two different cars are trying to, to uh, go through the same corner at the same time. And that's where the problem arises right now, is different agendas on, on the same track. How do you address that? So 
Yeah, Good exactly. question, Bill. If I knew that, I'd be the king of the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, can, can, you, can you, for instance, I mean, I know that I, especially compared to the two of you and especially compared to Bill, I was never much of a racer. I enjoyed vintage racing, driving a slow car as fast as I possibly could on, on, a, on a track that I knew very well. Um, but there's always that thing that people look, some people look down on their noses at much of U.S. historic racing. Thing. Those guys aren't racing. They're just parading around the track. Um, can you do it in an event where you have different classes for people who want to do different things with different cars? Or do you risk sort of not finding the right audience? Well, I, I feel one of the problems that has been in vintage racing for years is it's too easy to get a license. You know, you're, you're mm -hmm. a... Uh, uh, an orthopedic surgeon from Des Moines and you go to driver's school and buy a McLaren M8F because you want to go racing. Uh, I have a friend of mine here in town who called me, he's, he's 68 years old. He says, I want to go racing. What, I, what do I get? I said, well, go rent a car from Phil Bagley and drive it. If, if you like racing, buy a car. If you don't like it, you haven't spent a roll. No, 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 I want to go racing. I said, well, then get a Sports 2000. There, mm -hmm. You got a little Pinto engine. Pinto engine? I don't want a Pinto engine. So his first race car at 68, he buys is Brian Redmond's Lola T330 Formula 5000 car. And when he called and told me, I said, <laughs> do you have a death wish? <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say that, um, and this is probably a cruel thing, and I'll be reviled for it, but uh, nothing would, would, would amuse me more than watching Brian Redmond uh, drive in a group of people who were very well-to-do dentists and, and, and lawyers driving Formula 5000 cars, which were incredibly scary when he was a young, brave, and talented man. And uh, he would just sort of lurk around the back of the field during practice and during the, the session until after about 10 minutes into the session, he just simply passed them all and lapped the field yeah. because he didn't want them to race against him because he knew it would be horribly bad for them. On Formula 5000 cars back in the day, we used to say the first thing at the scene of the accident was the driver followed shortly thereafter by the engine and the gearbox. You know, when you, when you step into a car like that on your first outing, um, and, and there are people who do that. I mean, there are people who buy, they want to go fast right out of the box. You know, that, that isn't the way you do it. So, uh, we have a question from, we want to take a question from, from one of the people who are watching uh, yeah. tonight, and we've got a nice crowd out there. Um, the question is, if a car is a replica, do you agree it needs to be identified as such and introduced as such at a race event as opposed to at the end of the event as they did at Goodwood? George Washington. Oh, I don't know that it matters. Ah, okay. That's provocative. Uh, I mean, do, why do we care that the thing is presented as a, uh, as a replica or not? Um, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't, Look, you have, I mean, wouldn't you have, just as, as a spectator, Miles, wouldn't you have more respect for that driver who came in fourth in an original GT4, you think, well, gee, this guy's a wanker who's just not pushing up to the front. But he actually came in fourth in an original GT40. Let the other guys in the replicas do whatever they want to, one, two, and three. You know, who cares he's not on the podium? He's in an original car. Yeah, except the, 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 the sharp end of that pack. I mean, the first 10 or 12 guys were all driving like their hair was on fire. You know, so this is all I can say is the guy that was in the first of the original cars uh, was driving his car exactly as hard as the replica cars ahead of him. Uh, and, and then the issue is, look, it, where is the bright line that distinguishes a replica from an original? Okay, this is a, you know this is another complex issue. That there question is, is right here. Thank you very you, much. You, you bet it was. So here's the thing, there is a, uh, this is a fuzzy continuum from absolute original, untouched, pristine automobile on the one end of the continuum to completely bogus, fake uh, uh, replica car on the other end. And there's a, a million cars on that continuum somewhere in there. And, and so how much replication are we talking about? Uh, you, you know, there are good Can-Am cars today that aren't on their original monocoque, and you're damn happy that they're not on their original monocoque because <laughs> it's all going to come unwrapped, at, at, you know, before the race ends. So when all the all the rivets let go, and you're sitting there in your uh, tidy whities and you're holding a steering wheel, right? Um, <laughs> so not the moment. 
Yes, I think so, so, so uh, that's the, a problem. Uh, Miles and, and, and Bill, I think, I think Murray, Murray has finally replica. joined us. Murray, okay. are you here? Murray, are, are you muted? Ah, okay. He's muted. So, okay. Maybe he'll you write know, in a question for us to, to hurl you guys. I, I was, uh, not to drop names, but I was talking with Carol Shelby one afternoon. He went to Goodwood, and uh, I think it was Jochen Moss was in like a 66 Corvette that smoked everybody big time, just blew them away. And uh, uh, there was another co Cobra Daytona Coupe in the race, and, and Shelby said, well, we're coming back next year with a car that'll smoke that one. You know, he was going to build one. <laughs> He's a racer. <laughs> so it, it, it goes up and down the whole range of things. I, I, I don't think that our opinions will have a whole lot of weight on what's going to happen. I, I, I really admired uh, Steve Earle and the strong arm with which he ran uh, uh, Monterey with years ago. Uh, and he had a flair for entertainment also in bringing Fangio in or the, building the Lamar replica of Pitts for Aston Martin. That seems yeah. to have gone away. Well, again, that, that's a part of, of the entire idea of the show. Um, and also, this is something I want to get to um, with this theme before we leave it, because there's another place I want to go. Uh, Miles, I know that in the, um, in the Miles Collier collection, you have that absolutely amazing 917 Porsche, mm -hmm. which is more original than, than the Porsche factory would probably dare keep it. And it's a car that has been started and has been out, but clearly it's not a car that you race. What point do you reach when a car moves from being an actual functional object to an historic artifact or sculpture? It's, it's a difficult, again, you know, there's no bright line that determines that, but I think the issue, the issue is this, um, and work with me a little bit on this. A car has two, a car is two entities, all right? One entity that, makes up the car is its physical being, its materiality, the actual stuff from which it is made, which goes back in the case of that 917 to 1969. And then it was rebuilt into as a, as a conventional uh, Kurze Heck car in 1970, blah, 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 up to the present. The other entity that's inherent in, a, in any car is its performance envelope. It's, uh, it's, the motion component of, of the matter motion dichotomy. All right. And at some point, some cars, because of their originality, reach the level that their matter, the physical stuff of the car becomes so important because it's now so rare and so original that having to exploit the motion side of things, its performance parameters becomes less important because there are other cars out there that don't have the artifactual originality that you can still drive the wheels off of. So the, so car, the idea the then would be so to... Th therefore, this 917 is important because of the, of the material of which it's made. There's plenty of other cars that have the 917s that have the same performance. If you want to see the thing go, you can see one of them. Go, go watch uh, Canada drive his. So you bring the Miles Collier collection 917 and park it in the paddock for people to admire and then go to the fence and watch Bruce drive by at great speed in his... This gets back uh -oh. to what I said earlier, no. <laughs> that, that, that there's vintage and there's historic. In a car like Miles's, the Martini and Rossi 917, you certainly wouldn't want to take it out and do anything that would destroy the historic nature of it. So it should be exercised, it should be seen, it should be smelled, and it should be, you should listen to it, but it shouldn't go wheel to wheel with that's uh, exactly, later cars. That, that's exactly right. And that is exactly our policy with that car. That car is capable of, of turning the same lap time that. Uh, that Bruce Canepa's car is, it's just, it'll never do that because that's yeah. a stupid thing to do with it. You know, the other thing I worry about, um, a few years ago, well, last year we had it, and then years before we had it, we had the Porsche 917 that won Le Mans. Well, when Porsche got into money problems in the 80s, they sold that car. Mm -hmm. And it ended up with Dr. Julio Palma as one of the owners, and he brought it to the show. Well, Monday morning, the internet lights up with... Amelia Island has fake 917 on the field because what Porsche, the factory did was 
they had sold that car. So they took another 917 out of the inventory and painted it up exactly like the Le Mans car. And I was at Essen and they had this beautiful display of Porsche with the car in the paddock at Le Mans and this other car that had been painted up exactly like it. Well, your mind would say, oh, that's the winning car. Oh, here it is here. So the internet lights up that Amelia Island had a fake car on the field. And about the time I was going to hammer out something on Facebook, someone <laughs> dropped in and said, oh, no, what you saw at Amelia was the real car. The factory has a fake. Now, over the years, the fog of time may eliminate the knowledge that's out there as to what's real and what isn't. Yeah, that's, which, and, which, you know, and that's which. a different issue yet again, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Introduce my next question, Miles. Please. Well, one would assume that right the there. Factory it's about what, it's about what cars, factories do with cars. By, uh, a, a private party, you know, uh, the factory didn't say that was the real car, but the uh, insinuation was that it was. Yeah. Th their silence is enough, and and that brings me to both a question that one of our viewers asks uh, specifically about a manufacturer, but I'm going to ask this in general. Um, they've asked, <clears throat> what about what Factory 5 is doing? But I will make that a broader question. What about not just Factory 5, but what about the manufacturers, Aston Martin, Jaguar, that are building replicas of their 1950s and 1960s race cars? Continuations. Where do those live? What Continuations, if you will. Yeah. Well, they well, are real Astons and they are real Jaguars, but to me, they're replicas. I mean... Hey, absolutely. Like, yeah. Lola T70s had continuations from the time the, the last real one came out and the others continued on, right? Mm -hmm. A, a D-Jag or an XKSS or an Aston Martin Zagato, there's a space of, what, 40 years in there? 40 years. Yeah, well, I mean... Uh, and, how do you, and how do you use those cars? They're, they're built, you know, by the factory, you know, with the original drawings, with the original construction techniques, etc. So... How do you use them? Do you vintage race those cars? Do you what? You, you take them out and you tell your friends about them and they pat you on the head and tell you what a good guy you are. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I guess in, in, in my world, I'd say you can go, you know, vintage race the damn thing if you want. I mean, they're not, they're not much good for much of anything because I agree with, uh, with Bill is that something that's been rebuilt, I don't care who it is, whether it's the factory or whether it's some dedicated craftsman who can produce this most amazing thing you've ever seen or not is that uh, those cars are modern replicas that are a simulacrum of what uh, was built back in the day. I would probably and, go so far as to say the factory five GT40s are much better than the original GT40s. The, the Jaguar factory will tell you that about their lightweight uh, cars that they just built. <laughs> I, I watched uh, a little presentation on the tube and uh, one of the narrators was saying, and these are, are, these are built just like uh, they were in the day. Oh yeah, they're built just like they're in the day, except we make them a little bit nicer. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so in other words, they're not built like they were in the day. Thank you very much. Now, you know, we're talking, you know, two or 3% nuances of, of refinement, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's not the same thing. It is one of the, one of the things, um, we, we talked, obviously, with a competition car of any sort. The day it, w it left the factory for its first event, after the event, it was brought back to the factory and comprehensively rebuilt. So the whole idea of an original race car with a history is, of course, ludicrous. But who, if anyone, should be responsible for deciding what is real, what is genuine, what is appropriate? That's a loaded question. Abs that's why I asked. <laughs> Go ahead, Miles. Have at it. <laughs> Okie dokie. I'm, re I'm ready. So I wanna, that, that's a deal that I want to crowdsource the answer to. What do I mean by that? The market will decide. None of us are smart enough, but the information's out there. We've seen it a million times. Some car is supposed to be a great thing. Actually turns out to be bogus. The market recognizes it. It doesn't get a whole lot of, uh, of joy when it comes up for sale. So we can crowdsource uh, th that answer. And, and you know, the, the problem is we are in a world of where there are very few clear 
and bright lines that distinguish A from B or B from C. Everything is sort of a smear, chromatic smear from one thing to another. And uh, it's very difficult to determine, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's original, what's not original. And I think the only way that that happens properly is the collective old car world and its collective infinite wisdom eventually makes a determination of that. I certainly think what that about, alternative, which is some czar somewhere de determining, you know, you're good, you're not good, is, is a, is a non-starter and a terrible idea. Uh, Bill, I, I'm going to also ask the two of you to actually now retry here in our courtroom, the Audrain Virtual Seminar Courtroom, the great uh, Bentley number one trial. No, actually, I'm not going to do that. But a question. <laughs> I have, I have, I have a, a, a very um, uh, strong opinion on this, but I want to get the opinion of you two gentlemen on this. Is it parts or is it continuous history? Which wins? Parts. Well, I guess I'm, I'm required to say continuous history then. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to, so get, the, uh, to get the show on the road. <laughs> well, yeah, because, you know, I think about, Bill, your, your race car, yeah. which is uh, a Group 44 Paul Newman race car. Is it the parts? <laughs> Funny stories about that car. I was having dinner with Bob Tullius one time and we were talking about acid dipping race cars. And uh, we, we were down at Philly's Tap Room in Daytona. And he says, we never did that at Group 44. Nah, if we did that, our sponsors would cancel. That's cheating. We wouldn't acid dip a car. I own two of his cars. They're both acid dipped. So I call that plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> He, they didn't tell him and he didn't know. So uh, as the car was built, it was uh, uh, acid dipped and tricked out. Back then they had Mercedes Benz half shafts because the SCCA rules said you could uh, make something more robust for safety reasons. So in the day they used Mercedes Benz half shafts on, on that car. After uh, group 44 had it, it went to Bob Cuneo in 1977, and he redid the car with a roll bar that an agent would want for his actor, which was Paul Newman. When I got the car, the only true changes we made is we added a Griffin radiator, because the car had a tendency to overheat, and a Mazda alternator. Everything else was as it was. Um, you know, someone could add, answer, asked, well, why didn't you use the Lucas generator? And I think everybody knows the answer to that. So those were the changes. You wanted to finish the race. On the TR8, it's as it was. But when it was built, it was built with a Ford nine inch rear end. Mm -hmm. It's got the BOP aluminum V8. It's pumping out. I got the dyno sheets from group 44. They were pumping out 370 horsepower, 375. We, we're doing 375, 380. So it's about the same as it was. Uh, we did make one change. That car used to eat Triumph gearboxes because it put out so much torque. They took fifth gear out and, and ran a four speed. And uh, we put in a one or T10 with the same gear ratio. Um, I preferred the Triumph gearbox, but it wasn't very dependable. And I don't like getting under a car. I've changed gearboxes and rear ends that are hot and it isn't any fun. So those are the only change. The only change we made on the TR8 was the gearbox. So Miles. So the the, the issue of of uh, continuous existence or parts. Yes. Look, I mean, I, I think there's probably cases on both sides. I mean, you know, that's the the, the thing about this. There's no. You can't come up with an A-B answer to almost anything because there's always <laughs> issues. Uh, if, if I end up having to, uh, to make a decision, I probably fall out, uh, you know, more on the, uh, on the, on the part side. But I can think of, of uh, scenarios where continuous existence is, is the key deal. Look, that's built around a, uh, you know, the, the George Washington's Axe concept. Uh, or as right. uh, in a little more refined environment, we among the philosophical set like to say, the ship of Theseus. 
same idea. You change all the boards and everything, and eventually, when is the ship no longer Theseus's ship? And that's maybe a little more appropriate to cars because it implies the number of parts that go into a car. And, and, and obviously, from day one in the life of that thing, and especially as it becomes a, a historical automobile where, where you, new old stock parts aren't available, we are gradually turning that thing, given enough time, into a ship of Theseus. And at, at some point, almost every car extant, if it's used enough, becomes a issue of continuing history, continuous history, not so much the bits that have been assembled. Though we can do a mental experiment, which basically says completely original car, take the chassis out, put a replica chassis in, put everything else back. Was that, would you rather have that or would you rather have a car that has a, the original chassis and every other part on it is, is brand new and made after the fact? Well, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is, but, but that begins to show you what the, what the problems with the, with, the, uh, with the whole concept is. But you know, gradually we are converting cars over time from original cars to something that uh, begins to approach shock a replica. You know, Miles, you hit on something very important earlier in the conversation, and that was the technology that came with monocoque construction back in the mm. late 60s, early 70s. Those cars were pop riveted and glued together. Yep. They were made to race for a season. And That's now it. 30 years down the road, and those things become not only flexible flyers, but extremely dangerous. And uh, if you got in an accident in one of those cars, you, you would have uh, 1970 injuries. <laughs> to go with your 1970. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And you, you put in a, a Ed Pink engine that's got 250 more horsepower and you got stickier rubber today and, 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 that's not going to be a pretty picture. And, and that's another argument for why I say, look, if you really want to drive the stuff hard, if you really want to take it to the, to the absolute limit, go run a replica. It's going to be safer for you. It's a better show for the, for the public and those few miraculous, wonderful surviving cars that are still around will go on to inspire people, use more sedately, and, and are available for historians and, and enthusiasts to examine it minutely, to, to examine the, you know, the, the, the thing up close, to, to, to get the feel of the onions in, in, in a way that you can't uh, uh, with, with something else. Yeah. You know, it's kind we of have uh, we have we have we have another we have another comment from from one of our viewers that I want to touch on, and uh, he brings up something that uh, you brought up, Bill, about uh, Steve Earle's unique talent for uh, spotting um, replicas or 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 modified cars. And he said the problem with policing the old race cars and much higher horsepower engines is how do you actually do it? And that's why drag racing got into bracket racing in the stock car class. Everyone got tired of engine teardowns at, until 4 a.m. He says it's frustrating to watch a car that should be equal to yours disappear on the first straightaway. So mm -hmm. is that, again, something that organizers can do to, to make it a little more of a level playing field? Well, here, here's another problem. Suppose some guy comes up with a perfect replica and represents it as a real car. And you of the organizers say, yeah, <clears throat> we know this isn't the real car. So, so then his attorney over his shoulder comes up <laughs> and says, you know, you've just uh, besmirched my client's car. I'm not putting that too far down the road. I think, I think there are people who would go to court to argue their case. I think you're right. And here's, here's the flip side of it. And, and, and you know, who knows, uh, you know, whether anybody actually does this, but uh, there are organizers who want to produce a, uh, you know, a, a $250 million grid. And you're not going to be able to do that with original cars. But there are people out there who own the original car, but they also have a replica of their original car. And guess what? They've been racing the replica. Yeah. And the organizer's going to say, yeah, well, I need my $250 million grid. So yeah, your uh, Cobra Daytona and your Ferrari GTO and your DBR1, yeah, they're all good, you know, bring them, bring them on, wink, wink, wink. I know they're a replica and you know they're a replica, go run them. And then what really gets interesting is the supposed original car, which is actually a replica, is racing and it gets backed into the tire wall. And now the original car, which wasn't backed into the tire wall, has, has recorded history that says it was wadded up at some race somewhere. Good luck with that one. 
<laughs> one, one time yes, I, I got a, phone, I got a photograph happened, of that all original car. It has on happened its more than yeah. once. Well, that, that's a, another point I was going to make. If you have an original car and you stuff it, you've stuffed it in front of thousands of people, and there will be a record of that. Uh, yeah. One year at Monterey, when they were celebrating Ford, Ford had the Mark IV Ford GT40 Le Mans winner, and across the aisle was another gentleman who will go nameless who had one painted the same way. And I went over to him and said, okay, which one, which one's real? Well, there are parts of both of them and yada, 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 yada. You know, um, there were parts of that car on this car and this car on that car. I said, come on now, don't do that. Uh, it wasn't unusual for a manufacturer and Ford was one of them and they, they did it several cars. I can't go into it. You know, I don't want to be sued, but there were cars that won a, a, a particular race of which there were several of their models and they would bring them back and paint them all as a winning car and send them out to the four corners of the United States to go into dealerships. Here is the car that won Le Mans. It may be in Portland, Oregon. It may be in Jacksonville, Florida. It may be in, in upstate New York on the same day. Yep. It is. It is. Um, um, one, one, of our, one of our viewers has asked the question, one of the words around which we're dancing is appropriate. What is and is not appropriate? Now there's a nice big open question for you. Gumball tires on a 917. Appropriate? Not appropriate. Not appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, those are the kinds of words <clears throat> that sort of have to inform what we do. And, and, and at the end of the day also, it, it's, it's up to the individual owners to make rational decisions as opposed to ones that are designed to inflate their egos or do other kinds of things. And you, you, in this marvelous world in which we live with all of these fabulous uh, artifacts that are priceless, that have seen uh, the march of time and the, the, the passing of, of incredible events, to sort of mess all of that up by doing really dumb, inappropriate things is, is just a shame. But there, there is no way that this is going to get there are no tablets coming down from the mountain <laughs> and we're going to have this, this stuff just has to get worked out and it's going to, it takes uh, people like Steve Earle, who I think walked that incredibly narrow line between making sure that there was a show and preserving the artifact. And there are other hugely important, wonderful uh, vintage events where that is not necessarily the case uh, where in fact it's tacitly uh, okay that if, you put on a good enough show and you stick it in the wall and wad the thing up. Well, you know, that's okay. We'll see you next year. You know, it is, and, it and is, Steve, it is, it is, Steve it was, is. was the kind of person who was, who just was offended by that. And, and the, the racing, at least the top, you know, first five or six cars in, in a race group would be put doing a great job and they'd never lay a glove on each other. We loved it. You know, uh, the, uh, the, the, there's another, um, a uh, 600 pound uh, canary in the cage, uh, I guess we should address, and that is putting pro drivers in a car. Some guy, ah. you know, uh, I, uh, I, I've seen drivers like Brian Redman put on a show that you wouldn't believe. I mean, his driving talent is so spectacular that it, 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 it was a pleasure to see him race. I remember in particular right after Vasek Polak died and he was driving that uh, BMW. And I think it was Brian Sessa. What a display he put on of talent. I mean, it, it made let everybody on the track look like a duffer. Yep. But I, but I think that, Bill, what you're talking about there, and I think we all agree with, with the way Brian conducts himself on and off the track, is different than putting a young professional driver yeah. who's still sort of proving his name and must finish first or else. And so there he's got to lap the, the field on the second lap. Otherwise, he's not doing his job. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, uh, that's the two different agendas on the grid issue that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That's where trouble begins. Now, as somebody who uses pro drivers all the time in my stuff, I use pro drivers because they crash less than other people do. <laughs> I find that a charming uh, aspect of pro drivers. But the, the, the first thing they're told above and beyond anything else when they strap in, you First thing you do is bring this thing back with no scratches on it. That's job one, that's job two, that's job three. Somewhere down there around job four or five, put on a good show, but don't risk the car. 
uh, you know, it, it really depends what you tell them. If they're sitting on the grid and you blow in their ear and say, win this one for the Gipper race, um, you know, then we, we're, we're back uh, at real racing. And, and uh, it, you know, if everybody else understands that, that's one thing. But if there's people out there who don't, it's not going to be good. The one thing that Steve Earle would always say, and Chris Vandegrift, both, don't go out and be a star. You're, the, the car is the star. What yep. you're doing is showing what these cars were like 20, 30, 40 years ago. And then, uh, you know, the, they, there's a point in time when the technology forces you to put the car into a demonstration mode as a race mode. And I use an example, the, uh, the, the early, early, early uh, pre-World War I cars that ran at uh, 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 Monterey and one of them one year, one of the wooden wheels broke and it flipped and uh, Ooh. it seriously injured two people. Ugh. Or, uh, you know, you're getting tires with new rubber that stick better, wooden wheels that are 100 years old. At some point in time, you just got to put them away. Yeah. Well, 50 year old exactly. mag wheels aren't too good either. No, magnesium <laughs> wheels. When I had my Brabham BT8, we always ran the car. <laughs> on Revolution aluminum wheels because the mag wheels were suspect. Yeah, you, you bet your life on those things. That was the, uh, that was the greatest thing. Uh, my last race car, um, as Bill and Miles both know, is a uh, uh, 1950 Crosley Hotshot base special. And the highest value in the car was the uh, magnesium uh, sprint car wheels that it ran on. And I was so proud of those wheels. And people said, aren't you worried about those? You know, you, you enter a corner too fast and, 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 and you, you roll the, the bead of the tire. It's going to hit the, 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 the track and it's going to explode. I said, if I get going that fast, I will explode. <laughs> so no worries there. Um, well, that's all the time that we've got for this uh, conversation. I could continue this conversation for another four hours. And I, I'm sure I will the next time I'm in the company of these two great gentlemen. And uh, thank you so much, Miles. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you uh, to all of you here watching this. And I want to remind you that our uh, virtual seminar series continues. Our next uh, one up on the calendar is a very exciting seminar with Jay Ward, the creative director of Cars with Pixar. And we're going to explore the process of creating characters from Cars with Jay in California and the life-size Sally Carrera in Porsche Museum in Stuttgart. So that should be a lot of fun. And I want to remind you all to please be sure to tune into our YouTube channel. We post two new YouTube videos a week on cars from the Audrain collection. And we have a lot of fun with them. And they're informative and entertaining. Subscribe. And also go to our website where you can see more about our exhibitions, including this one, Race Trek to the Opera, Mark Did It All, which is running here in the museum in Newport until November 15th. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Great fun. Loved it. Thanks.